And do you know how many permits we have here in Kemet? Anybody knows? No. We start in... Seventy? Mm -hmm. Any other suggestions? Ninety-four pyramids. We have ninety-four pyramids all over Kemet. So don't try and convince me that people from outer space, we are not hiring them to come and build the pyramid and go back and come and build. I mean, if it was just one pyramid, one of its kind, then we can buy this, we can accept it. But it was built in stages. And this is very interesting to realize here, greenery on your right side and then desert. Suddenly, desert on the left side. It's like life and death, right? It's very symbolic. Uh, because here in this desert, we have tombs. This is all tombs side. It's a cemetery. That's Saqqara. It's a cemetery. Actually, Saqqara and Memphis are two different names given to one place. Mm. Memphis was the city of life, the city of the living, where the palaces of the pharaohs were erected. And Saqqara is a cemetery where the tombs of them are found. No, I won't have a chance. Because I'm a woman, I'm not going to get my rights. Come! Again. Have your attention, please. Attention, s'il vous plaît. I'm going to give you now uh, an introduction about our ancient Kemetic history or Egyptian history, uh, which will make things easy for us in the next couple of days. So when I say Old Kingdom or Middle Kingdom or New Kingdom, you'll know which period exactly I'm talking about and how did the sequence goes like. And if you have any questions, please leave them at the end. When I say anyone has questions, you can start asking me whatever you like. So, the history of ancient Kemet, or Egypt, started thousands of years before Christ. But the first written Medun Netter, or hieroglyphics, that we found dates back to the date 3100 BC. Historians classified that period as the Archaic period which is composed of two dynasties, first dynasty and second dynasty. What do I mean by a dynasty? A dynasty is a period of time in which a family ruled, like a father, followed by his son, followed by his grandson, and so on. When it's the end of one family and the beginning of another family taking over, it's the beginning of a new dynasty or another dynasty. In the glorious part of our history is composed of 30 dynasties, three zero in which we had three important periods. To remember them easily, remember my three fingers here. That's Old Kingdom. That's Middle Kingdom. That's my middle finger is Middle Kingdom. That's New Kingdom. The Old Kingdom is referred to as the Pyramid Age. That's the first Golden Age. All the pyramids all over Kemet were built in that period, which is about 2,500 years BC, 2,500 years BC. That's Old Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom is about 2,000 years BC. The New Kingdom is about 1,500 years BC. The drops between my fingers, these are periods of weakness and collapse. Things happened here that led to the decline of the empire. We call the first drop, the first decline the first intermediate period. The second one is the second intermediate period. Things happened here that led to the decline of the empire. What happened here first? After the pyramid age, after constructing the pyramids, after having this beautiful golden age, starting by having this pyramid on the rear behind us, which is the step pyramid, that's the first pyramid ever built in the history of mankind, followed by a series of pyramids that developed, that, made, that, that became bigger and nicer, and more powerful, a sign of power and strength. Decline happened in the society and in the empire. This decline is because of the first civil war that was witnessed in Egypt or in Kemet. That's the first intermediate period. The rulers of every province and governorate in the north and the south fought among themselves about the limits of their lands. They wanted to have more land and more property. And this led to the decline of the empire. Then, a Nubian brave pharaoh from the south of Kemet, 
from the Middle Kingdom period, which is about 2000 years BC, was able to re reunify the North and the South. I'm saying reunify because there was a previous unification before the first, before those three fingers here, in the Archaic period, in the first dynasty, Kemet was split into two kingdoms, North and South. Like for, for instance, Yemen nowadays. Four fights and wars between the North and the South, the same was here in Kemet. Until both lands were unified together by Narmer, or Mina, that's, he was also from the South. He was able to unify the North and the South for the first time in the history of Egypt. Then, after having this first intermediate period and the decline period, a reunification happened on the hand of one of the Nubian pharaohs from Upper Kemet, and he maintained order, and it was an, another period of glory and prosperous, which is the Middle Kingdom period. Then, another drop. That's the second intermediate period. That's the first foreign invasion that occurred in Egypt. The first foreign uh, um, invasion was on the hands of a group of people that we call the Hyksos. The Hyksos. They were nomadic people. We don't know exactly where they came from, but it was easy for, th for them to come and, and conquer because they had two new weapons unknown to the Egyptians. Those two new weapons were the horse and the war chariot. The horse and the war chariot were their idea. This was for them uh, a new equipment that they used which helped them to penetrate and stay in our society for about a century, for about 100 years, until another brave man came from the south in the New Kingdom period and he was able to use their own weapons after advancing them and turn it against them and drag them out. And it was the third and final period of glory and prosperous, which is the golden age or the new kingdom period in which we have all the famous kings and queens that we hear about. Like King Tutankhamen came from here. King Ramses II came from here. King Echnaton. You heard about Echnaton. Echnaton is the first one to say that there's only one God. He was the husband of Queen Nefertiti, the beautiful Queen Nefertiti. And all the famous kings and queens, and my favorite queen in ancient Egypt, her name is Hatshepsut, also came from that period. I'm not going to tell you much about it. I'll tell you more about her in Memphis. And I'll tell you why she is my favorite when we go in Memphis. And please always remember that suspense is my middle name. <laughs> it will always keep you in suspense. So all the famous names of kings and queens came from that beautiful golden period, which is the New Kingdom period. So this is the most three important periods. After that came a late period. Then came the Greek invasion in the year 332 BC, 332 BC. After the Greek invasions came the Roman invasion in the year 30 BC. After the Roman invasion came the Arab invasion in the year 642 AD. So this is how the sequence goes like, Old Kingdom, Pyramid Age, First Intermediate Period, Middle Kingdom, Second Intermediate Period, New Kingdom, Late Period, Greek invasion, Roman invasion, Arab invasion. So. The Egyptians are not Arabs, because before we have the Arabs in our lives, we have our own race and our own societies, long before the Arabs came in our lives. And the more of the original Egyptians are in the south, all the Arabs, the Greeks and the Romans, they settled more in Cairo and in the north. So this is just a very brief introduction, so that you follow the sequence of the history to know how it goes like. So most of the people we see now are the descendants of the invaders. Here okay. in the north. Yes, that's right. As you go more in the south, that's more of the original yeah. Egyptians. Dark-skinned people, black people, smart people, <laughs> powerful people, beautiful people. Yeah. So, yeah. Nefertari and Nefertiti, same people? No, yeah. Nefertari and Nefertiti are two different queens. Okay. Nefertiti was the wife of King Echnaton. He's the one who said that it's only one god. He's the one who took his wife called Tell al Amarna and practiced his religion with God as the mediator between God and the people. And he created what we call realism and art. Like if God created me like this, I'm going to be shown exactly like he, what he did. There's nothing wrong with that. If I'm fat, if I'm, uh, you know, having a broken arm, I have a certain kind of an illness, I'm going to be depicted exactly as how God created me. 
because before his period, all the kings used to present, represent themselves in the most perfect form, with a beautiful smile on the face, strong body, muscles, you know, strength and power. Maybe he doesn't look like that, but he wanted to be shown in the best way possible. So after resurrection, he will be resurrected on that beautiful, perfect form. So Ikhnaten break, broke that tradition. That's his wife is Nefertiti. And he created what now? Realism in art. And Nefertari was the wife of Ramses II. Okay. Ramses II is the one who raised Moses, the one that we talked about yesterday. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see his beautiful statue in Memphis when we drive to Memphis. I'm out. Yes, sir. Um, the, the Sphinx do not have faces. I think because I'm from the pole and shut them off. Uh, not all, just the nose. Just the nose. When we go to the Sphinx, you'll see that. Do we have any any indication what the, the shape of the nose was like? African, flat uh -huh. nose. Uh -huh. Yeah. Sure, it, it, it will be very obvious when we see even the traces of it. <laughs> <laughs> king, our king. So before we go inside, please. Before we go inside, please. Hold on, everybody. I'm, I'm giving this briefing to find it easy for us when we go inside. It's not just the pyramid. We're going to see here, we're going to see a complete complex. This is the first stone construction ever made in the history of mankind that we're about to see. And the builder to that complex is one of the most genius, beautiful African men known in the history of mankind. His name is Imhotep. You heard about him? He's one of the most significant, important leaders in ancient times. Imhotep was an architect and an engineer. And, and, you know, he was also in medicine. He was a physician. He made a lot of things. He was worshipped at its stage because of what he did, not worshipped as a god, but worshipped, you know, in his qualities. He was so gifted. He was a high priest too. And he made that complex for a king. His name is King Zoser. That's Z-O-S-E-R. Zoser is the founder of the Old Kingdom. He's the first king in the Old Kingdom period. And he made him that complex. We are now in a cemetery. Remember that. To be exactly as the king, what the king had in his life in Memphis. What does that complex show? It, I'll just make you a small uh, drawing here. This complex used to be surrounded by a huge enclosure wall. This is an enclosure wall. This is part of the original enclosure wall, about 2,400 years BC, what you're seeing right now. And wait until you touch it. So smooth and so beautiful as if it's made a month ago, not thousands of years back. This huge enclosure wall used to have 14 doors. 13 out of the 14 are false doors. Only one true entrance, which is this one, located in the southeast corner of the complex. This is the entrance. The entrance leads to a colonnade, a passageway. In this colonnade, when we see it, you will find columns. 20 columns on each side. So there are 20 columns here and 20 columns there. This number of columns is connected with the number of provinces or governorates in ancient Kemet. There were 20 governorates in the north and 20 governorates in the south. So that's why there's a column for every province depicted in this colonnade. Then this colonnade opens to a small court, which opens to the great open court. In the great open court, the main feature there is the pyramid, which is the first pyramid to be built. In front of the pyramid, there are four letters, like the D letter shape, like this, and like this, and two backwards. So there are four D letter shapes. They are in front of the pyramid right here. Why? And why is that complex made? And why here? because there was a very important national festival celebrated in ancient Kemet. This festival is known to us as the Heb Sed Festival, H-E-B-S-E-D Festival. This is to show the power of the king and the strength that he is still capable of ruling the north and the south as a pharaoh. This festival should be held once every 30 years. The king has to do a number of exercises in front of everyone. That's why we have those columns. There should be a deputy from every province attending this important event to witness that the king is still powerful and strong, willing to rule Kemet or Egypt for the next 30 years. Among what he has to do is fighting a bull and knocking it down to show that he's still strong and powerful. 
running among those four D letter shapes, holding a roll of papyrus in his hand in a special ritual way while he's pointing out to the four D letters as if he's controlling the four sides of Egypt, north, south, east, and west, which were for him the four sides of the whole universe. He has to do a lot of other things. When he's done what, with what he had to do, he sits on a platform that we are going to see inside, also made out of stone, and enjoy the festival. There were dancers. Our ancestors were great dancers. They were great musicians. They were great artists. They were great worshipers. They gave just to every single aspect in life. They knew how to enjoy life. They knew how to enjoy God. They knew how to worship. They knew how to live. They know how to smile. They know how to love. And this is what they did. So this is part of what the king do after he finishes all what he has to do. He sits and enjoys the festival. The dancers and the musicians and everything taking place in front of him in the open court. So Imhotep, the genius architect, made him a copy of what the king had in Memphis, which was made out of what? Of mud. In Memphis, it was made out of what? Of mud. Even the palaces were made out of mud. When we go to Memphis, you'll tell me, Emel, where are the palaces? Where did the pharaohs live? I'll tell you all what you're going to see is foundations. The first life is nothing. No one cares about it. Our ancestors cared about the second life. They lived the first life. They enjoyed it. But they worked for the second life more. They saved the hard stones, the effort to build monuments and temples and tombs which are connected with resurrection and life after death. That's the eternal life. So Imhotep made a copy of what the king had in Memphis that looked like that with the 14 doors and the enclosure wall and everything that I explained within the complex but was made out of mud but made out of stone to be used for the same reason after resurrection for the king to practice this festival after resurrection or during the life after. Any questions? Let me, let me interject there a minute. It's real interesting. The first life doesn't matter. But it is the life to come. When we were in Ghana, we were told that they always made sure they take good, took good care of the dead in order that when, the, when they arrived on the other side, the ancestors could say, okay, they took good care of you. Now, I know we complain about it in America, but it's just something to think about. Maybe that's why we spend so much on funerals. Mm. Mm. All right, friend. Because we all recognize that we are sometimes better to people in death than we were to them in life. So maybe that's one of those cultural carryovers that we need to think about. Mm -hmm. And um, Amal, what exactly does Imhotep mean? Uh, Imhotep means he who is walking in peace or he who is coming in peace. Hotep means peace, and Im means walking or coming. Let's go inside, please. No, go outside. That's not more. I got it. We are now in the open court. This is the open court 
And as you see, the pyramid is standing so beautiful back there. The first pyramid ever built in the history of mankind is straight ahead of us, right there. Built by the great man Imhotep, who was gifted by God in many, many aspects and many characteristics. That he didn't uh, mind sharing it with the people and giving it to the people and passing it to the people. How was the pyramid built? And what was the system of burial before the pyramid? And is it a tomb? Is it a place of burial? Well, inside the pyramid, there is a burial chamber in which the mummy of the king should be preserved or kept. But is that all? No. The pyramid is much more than just being a tomb. It's basically a, like a temple, a place of cult, a place of worship. That's why it's made or designed in that particular form pointing upwards toward the sky, towards God, towards, you know, sun, towards the Lord, up there. That's why it's taking that particular form. So it's not just a tomb, as some people like to call it, a tomb or just made to be a place of burial. That's not just the whole concept. It's much more deeper than that. Before having the pyramid used in the old kingdom period, they used to make their burials in what we call mastaba. The mastaba is a rectangular piece of stone that comes on ground level. In the middle of it, they make a shaft under the ground and a room to put the mummy inside. When we first discovered the site here, over 170 years ago, that was the first excavation to be made in Saqqara, the first Europeans who uh, you know, entered here, they said that, well, this is how the pyramid was built. They made the first mastaba. Then the architect changed his mind about the size of the burial chamber. He wanted to make it bigger, so he added the second mastaba. Then he wanted to be, have it a bit, a bit bigger, so he added the third mastaba. And so on until they became six mastabas, or six steps, gradually decreasing in size. This is, I, I don't want to say the, word, the American famous word. <laughs> Starting with B, but I'm not going to say it. This is ridiculous. Battle of science. <laughs> They just want to say that it just came out of mere chance coincidence. It's not true, and we're going to prove it. We're going to see by our eyes how it was made and how it was designed to be big and, and huge from the very beginning as we go closer to it. It was made in steps. Why? That's religion again. That's connected with the cult and the faith of the ancestors. They thought at that stage, at that time, that the soul will need those steps to ascend to heaven and to ascend to sky. So that's why it was made out of steps form. And another reason is that it's the first pyramid. It was taking, you know, it's time in stages. When we go and see the pyramids this afternoon in uh, Giza, the great three pyramids, you will find them much huger and smoother because it's, it's more advanced, it's later. But he's the pioneer, Imhotep. That's the first pyramid to be built. You heard about the Japanese attempt about four or five years back with all the money and the technology that they have, and they couldn't do it. So that's why they started making stories about aliens and people from outer space. No, 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 no. Our ancestors did it, and it's the reason of building it. And how it was achieved is because of faith. If your heart is strong, your body is strong. Not just the muscles, it's the heart. The heart is the main organ that supplies the whole body with power, with strength. If you believe in what you're doing, you'll be the most successful man in the whole world. So this is what the ancestors did. They believed in what they're doing. They believed in God. They wanted to make the pyramid form, and they did it. It took Imhotep years out of a lot of scientific research and accurate measurements until he reached out for the idea of making it in the pyramid form and accomplishing it in this beautiful construction as we see. This is how the pyramid was built, out of faith, out of belief. And, and the, the second pyramids that were built after Imhotep, they are located in a site called Dahshur, about 10 miles away from here. And this used to be a military base. It was not allowed to visit it at that time. So uh, they belong to the father of Khofo. You know Khofo? No, That's no. Kiops. Yes. Kiops is the Greek version of the original name, which is Khofo. The father of Kiops, or Khofo, his name is Senefro. His two pyramids that were built before Khufu or Kiops, the pyramid that we'll see in the afternoon, were bigger, 
but one of them is bent. There was an error in construction. <laughs> that was the second step. So they finished it as it was with the error. Then he gave directions and, and you know, to make another pyramid which is complete with no error. So that's why he has two pyramids for his, himself. <laughs> one with an error and one perfect and complete. Then his son made the huge pyramid of Giza, the one that we'll see in the afternoon. So it developed from one stage to the other. One mistake led to the correct, you know, one that came after it. So no people from outer space came, no aliens. It was all built in stages. It was all built out of faith. It was all built out of accurate measurements and studies. And it's not just the pyramids. Every other thing that we see in Kemet, in every different period, there's a different style. There's a different burial. And they are all amazing. Because it's faith, faith, faith behind it. And that was the main reason of success and victory and conquer. I'm out. <laughs> there it. Go ahead. Did you say how long it took to build this? We, we have an assumption about this one that it took him about 20 years mm -hmm. for this one. Only? Only. The, the great one for Khufu, Kyops, at the pyramids this afternoon, 30 years. Only. And you'll be amazed to realize how it was built. I mean, when we see the, the, the pyramid this afternoon at Giza, and you'll see the size of stone that sometimes each piece of stone weighs about 5 tons and 10 tons. How did they get it up? I'll answer this when we go there. Another question, I'm, uh, I'm out. Uh, there is no stone anywhere in miles wrong. Where did the material come from? No, uh, actually, sir, this is all limestone, and we have quarries of limestone uh, all around here. So there, there are uh, quarries of limestone around here. The only uh, stone that's not around here, it's called granite stone. It's in Aswan. It's still in Egypt, but it's in the southernmost part of Egypt. Um, it's about an hour and a half flying, you know about 1,000 kilometers, something like that. So uh, they used even granite. They used to bring it. Sometimes if you want, they want to give a nice look to a special part of the temple yeah. using granite, they get it. They cut it from the quarries there in Aswan and float it on the Nile. That's the main way of transportation mm. to be applied here. But the basic stone that was available in, in, the, in Giza Plateau was the limestone. That's why the pyramids and the complex here is made out of limestone. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm before you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've used two words that carry negative connotations for us, but when you said it, you did not say it with a negative <laughs> connotation. You used the word mummy. I used the word mummy? Mummy. Uh -huh. All right, and when we think of mummies, uh -huh. it's always negative. Why? Because in the States, a mummy is a ghost. A mummy is somebody who frightens you. A mummy is somebody who is either playing dead or who is dead, but who walks around in the sarcophagus frightening the living. All right? And you used mummy so calmly as though all it was was a corpse. All right? The second word you use that has a, a seriously negative connotation in America is cult. What? <laughs> cult is a horrible word in America. We ought to go be a cult. That's right. <laughs> Why? Because a cult implies an individual who gets a group. You know of the Guyana tragedy, the Jim Jones group in uh -huh. Guyana uh -huh. with the drinking of the Kool-Aid uh -huh. and stuff. So. Well, see, yes, whenever white America wants to write you off, uh -huh. the first thing they say is you're a cult. Oh my God. And you use the word cult in a way that it does not carry those kind of connotations. Well, because it, 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 it just represents completely different meanings to us here. Cult is worship, practicing the religion, practicing your feelings towards God, towards the Creator. So that's cult, that's worship. Well, that's well, that's very um, well, the American connotation, spiritual. Yeah, the American connotation is that it is worship, uh -huh. but not toward God, but toward the individual who is who is allegedly leading you to God. See, like like see, I understand what the Europeans do when they come here. They look at what is going on, and they discredit it. Uh -huh. See, they uh -huh. they would say that the the king that's buried here is who. Zoser? Zoser. Uh -huh. They would say that the people who followed Zoser followed him because Zoser had a cult. Oh, yeah. See, not, nothing to do with God, 
Zoser was pretending to be God, or the people thought Zoser was God. See, that's, that's how America interprets, defines cult. <laughs> You know, it's, it's regarded, usually the Pharaoh is regarded not as God, but as the mediator, the link. Because he's the one who's got, the, you know, who, who goes to the temple? Who goes to the Holy of the Holies? There's something wrong with using the word Holy of the Holies? <laughs> Maybe it's interrupted yeah. differently in the States. Yeah, and let, or the sanctuary. Yeah, and let me say that mm. biblically, we have always had a problem with Paul saying to us uh, to respect government. All right, but historically, government was believed to be of God, and even Paul says there is no power but the power of God, and Paul instructs us to obey our our government officials. So that comes out of Egypt, where the government official was also religious, was godly. You know, it was believed that Zosa and others were men designated by God, and Hotep were men designated by God to lead the people. But in America, it's only certain preachers that America decides who are really men of God. And then remember, we have in the West the separation of church and state, sacred and secular, the natural and the supernatural, whereas you don't have that here. Everything is supernatural. Right. Yeah. right. As I was speaking about the temple, um, the temple is a different uh, elements, starting with the pylon, followed by the court, followed by the, what we call the hypostyle hall, which is a hall full of columns, followed by the sanctuary, that's at the end of the temple, or the holy of the holies, where the statue of the divine is placed. The only two who got the right to step in the sanctuary are the high priest and the pharaoh. And usually the high priest is the pharaoh himself, is the king himself. And according to the levels that you get in your education in the priesthood, it allows you to go from one part of the temple to the other. There are 42 levels of education for the priesthoods. It takes years and years and years until you acquire the 42 levels. It's not easy to get the right to be a high priest, to enter to the most sacred part of the temple. So for, for the ancients, for the ancestors, it's regarded that the high priest is uh, the most you know, spiritual person, like, for, for example, for the Muslims nowadays, the sheikh, the sheikh of Azhar. Mm -hmm. They don't consider him as God, but they respect him, they listen to him, or him, it's like, you know, the prophet, or, you know, I can't use words like that, it's, I mean, deep, but I mean, for them, inside the, 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 the hearts of the people, it's like, for example, the Pope, how is he treated? Exactly, exactly. See how he comes out and people wave and kneel and uh, try and uh, hold him and try and hold, you know, whatever his... This is, for, for the ancestors, was even deeper than that. Exactly. And it, w it was meaningful. Exactly. <laughs> Much more meaningful. But so all of I'm that just giving examples, here. you know, from sure. our modern sure. times sure. To, to make the image closer for, uh, for us, I mean, to, to understand or to comprehend the concept yeah. of belief and cult. Yeah. Okay. At St. Paul. Okay. okay, maybe you said it under the news, but are we standing on the inside of a pyramid or a arena? Uh, no, this is inside the complex that was built by Imhotep. Okay, we'll start walking in this direction, please. What she's talking about is how our ancients practice Namaste. Yes. Then different kinds of relax. Namaste. Mm -hmm. That's all. They saw divinity in Imhotep. They saw divinity in the Pharaoh. They saw divinity in the people who led them. They didn't see degrees. They didn't see pedigree necessarily. You know, and even if there was pedigree involved, it was involved in so far as they believed a family was mm -hmm. a God. Mm -hmm. And then when a family, of course, went astray, they would find a way to create another dynasty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they, be they believed that God worked through people. Mm -hmm. And that's what we don't believe now. Mm -hmm. We really don't believe that. That's why namaste is such a critical word for us, because as long as we don't see the divinity in each other, yes. we've got black on black crime, we've got, you know, backbiting, we've got all kind of other stuff going on. But when we see the divinity in each other, the divinity is what unites us, mm -hmm. you know? Spirit, blood may be thicker than water, but spirit is greater than blood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it, I mean, it's, it, it makes all the sense in the world. 
that when the Jews put stuff together in, in the wilderness, they had to practice some of the stuff they saw practice the 400 and some years that they were in Egypt. Moses came out of here, high yeah. priest. Exactly. 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 <laughs> yes, so full of sand. It's all right, it's worth it. Okay. So they killed him for this, what, 17 year old son? Or something like that in place? Mm -hmm. Or brother. Or brother. To, to then came in. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Uh, we are now in the middle of the open court, still within the complex. Behind us here is the platform for the king where he sit and witness all the activities that was taking place in front of him in the court which is straight ahead of us here. Everything that you're seeing is limestone, which is amazing to realize the fact that this is the first stone construction ever made in the whole world, 2400 years BC. What was the approximate population? Well, we have different statistics about it. Some people think there were about 4 million. Okay, so whenever Hepset was, whenever Hepset took Practice, place, yeah. who was present? Was the, a deputy was the from common. every province. Okay, but the common people were not present. Not all of them. No. Okay, okay. Some of the priests, you know, okay. a priest from every temple. Right. Okay. Not the celebrities. Okay. Not the common. Okay, so it's like he was the president and the Congress was present. <laughs> <laughs> or the prime minister and the exactly. parliament. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's pulpit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Was this covered? Uh, no, this was all open. That's why it's called the open court. You know, we also fail to recognize is that Jewish culture, just like Zechariah talked to us and told us how the present Jewish language is put together, all right, with Spanish, with German with some right, English. Right, right. Jewish culture is really an amalgamation of more than just something pure. And a whole lot of it is Egyptian. Yes. Because how can they, how, remember the whole thing was you can't get, you can get children of Israel out of Egypt, but you can't get Egypt out of the children of Israel. And, and they left Egypt. They didn't come to stay. They came to get food. Mm -hmm. They had had a fa famine in Canaan, and they, they, they came just to get food and wound up staying here. And one of the reasons, we don't want to ignore Joseph. Joseph had significant input in the Jews having a good life in Egypt. Right. Mm -hmm. But the issue is that he had that because he was able to interpret a dream. But still, he was smart enough to run things in accordance with Egyptian culture. Absolutely. Uh, not now. I'll be back. That the Hebrews came into Egypt, it was really treated well. There's only one time they came in here, and that was after the invasion of the Hittites, that they were run out, that they were not treated well. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. every and time they come, came, they left. You remember what I, what I remember about Hyksos when we were in Ghana? Yeah. What's his name? Ankara? Yeah. It said Hyksos, when he translated it into the Twi language, yes. which was believed to be the original language of mankind, it meant those who loot and burn. In the Twi language, that's what it means. And in history, that's what they wound up doing. So you got African, that's you got real Egyptian. Deep. And it isn't necessarily that African and Egyptian are different, but Egyptian is a derivative of African.
house of the north and the house of the south behind it. The house of the north and the house of the south. That's again part of the complex of what Imhotep did for King Zosar. There's nothing inside there. But this is supposed to be for the king again, the same way as it was in Memphis, for the king to change his garment and to change his crown. If he's receiving someone from the north, he goes in the house of the north and wear the crown of the north oh. and the garment of the north. Oh. If he's going to see someone from the south, he goes in the house of the south, wear the crown of the south and the garment of the south. And, respect and receives the deputies from all over. All right. I need... Uh... I need a place built at St. Paul <laughs> to receive the women and one to receive the men. <laughs> Here are not that big. They are not. Wait until you compare them to the size of the stones in Hello. the Great Pyramids this afternoon. Much, in? much bigger. Is there, an entrance? Uh, there is no uh, entrance here. Actually, there is an entrance, but it's closed long time ago because of the danger of the falling blocks. Uh, this entrance, by the way, before I talk to you about the entrance, take a look at this deep hole right here. Take a look at the stones back there. This pyramid goes up 60 meters high. The foundation goes down about 40 meters of stone. Uh, how many feet? How many feet? 80 feet up, 120 feet down. Thank you, sir. So that's about 120 feet down there of stone. So it was meant to be huge in the first place remember about the first theory that he said he changed his mind and he added this and he changed his mind and he added that no 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 when we dug down there we found that deep foundation so it was meant to be a pyramid in the first place i, I just want to add to, to, to make sure we have an architect here who, oh. who explains that the average building now is 10 feet floor to floor mm -hmm. so that means that it's 12 stories down and 18 stories up. They have to go. Uh, they have to go down. About two thirds the height down. Yeah. 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 That's how many feet? Uh, 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 about 50. 90. 90. 28. Run it off the 28 meters. About 90 feet down. There's the burial chamber that was first excavated in the year 1821 by a European who was paid to come to dig and see if there are treasures and so on. He was able to enter and penetrate to the inside of the burial chamber through a hole in the roof of, or, you know, of the ceiling. When he went inside, he found parts of a mummy. King Zoser, King Zoser's mummy, and few inscriptions of papyrus with the name Zoser, and hundreds and thousands of alabaster jars. What's that? He, uh, you know, uh, alabaster is a kind of stone which is beautiful and shiny stone. You'll see it in the bazaar this afternoon. So he took some of the bazaar, uh, I mean, <laughs> some of the alabaster and the mummy and the papyrus and he sailed them to Europe and we lost them forever in a sea storm. Let me ask you, had, I, I was going to lead up to that. That has not happened with Tutankhamun, has it? No. Okay, Tutankhamun, everything belongs to the Egyptians? Yes. Okay. Hello, Howard Carter took some of his belongings. You know the ankh that looks like the cross? Yes. The ankh, it's a sign of life. Neb ankh means above life because you're in a stage now to be above the first life, towards the eternal life. That's the original word for that box that's now called sarcophagus, which is an insult for the history, I mean, and for the, the name, and people don't know it, but it's important to point it out why yes. the meaning of it, and yes. the original name is Neb ankh for that box. Okay, now I'm good. Uh, and to add to what Pastor said just now, that the Europeans, uh, when they're not here with an interest in culture, whenever they show any activity in culture, it's only to distort it. Oh, yeah. 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 Let me now, now, the sarcophagus, I'm, I'm, I'm getting clearer. Mummy, for us, means you're in that cloth. We thought that the cloth was the sarcophagus. Yes. But instead, the coffin is the sarcophagus. What is the... The wrapping. The, the wrapping. The linen. 
the linen. Yes. All right. And remember, y'all, Jesus was wrapped in linen. And remember that our forefathers, whenever they would pray, they would say, Lord, I thank you that I woke up this morning and my cover was not my winding sheet. See? Yeah. See, all of that, all of that's critically important. Yeah. There's another word that comes up in the Bible. Waddling, Lord. Swaddling. 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 Do, do you have a definition for that? No, I don't know. The, the that's when, you have when Jesus Christ was born, it, it tends to emphasize that his mother wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Oh, yeah. So, you know, that that's, of course, that's... That's, European, what is it? That's linen. That's linen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing yeah. major? No, 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 no. Okay. This is what I know, that it's, it was wrapped in linen. And everybody was wrapped in linen. Mm -hmm. Poor and poor people were wrapped, wrapped in linen. linen. Um, can I ask you if you can explain what my art meant, and my art was the standard of um, the principle by which we live by here? My art. My art, actually, can I have your attention as a goddess of righteousness and truthfulness and justice? But did the ancestors worship many gods and many goddesses? Were they paganists as it was claimed by the Arabs? No. I'll give examples. For example, for the Muslims, when they say Allah, they give Allah 99 <coughs> names. The generous, the light, that's the sun, the light, the, the merciful, the truthful. The, the just fall, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, I can't remember all the names, but these are all qualities. The same with the ancestors. They believed in the one God and his many faces. So Ma'at is one of the faces of God, goddess of truth and justice. She was always depicted, as we're going to see her in the Papyrus Institute, as a woman, she's a woman, with a feather on her head. Why is, anyone knows what feather, <coughs> what kind of feather is that? Ostrich. Ostrich feather. Do you know the reason why is it ostrich feather? No. It's ostrich feather because the ostrich is the bird that always seeks the truth. Mm. When it digs its head down and it turns, it turns very quickly in all directions. <coughs> Not going from one angle and another angle and that's it. But it goes in all directions, in all angles. So that's why it's a sign of, of, of justice, you know, and truthfulness. <laughs> so Ma'at, simple, is having the ostrich feather on her head being goddess of truth and justice <laughs> and one of the faces of God yes okay <laughs> and also speaking of mummies I want to straight that out I was planning to tell you about it in the museum tomorrow but since the issue was raised um, why did they keep the body because it was believed that the body will be the same body to be used in the second life was it kept for everyone no only for the pharaohs not everyone can afford mummification. It was a very costly process. We have three different kinds of mummification. If you can do it, you can. If you can't, you can't. But they are trying to, do, to make the best that they can, you know, to take care of everything that they were gifted with. Even if it's not going to be used in the eternal life, they were going to come in a different way, in a different look, in a different body. But they were trying to protect and, and keep the, the first form protected after death as much as possible. Mm. So during mummification, what did they do? Uh, they used a mummification table, a special mummification table with a hole at the end and a basin to collect, you know, all the blood and things coming in that basin. They make a small opening on the right side of the body. From that small opening, they take all the organs out. Four organs are treated in a special way. Those four organs are the lungs, stomach, intestine, and liver. The lungs, stomach, intestine, and liver. Each of those organs is dipped in certain oils that were referred to as the sacred oils. The seven sacred oils. And this is the secret of mummification that we still up to now don't know. And the tomb of King Tut that was believed to be intact was opened and stolen before. What they stole out of this tomb is the seven sacred oils that were placed in certain jars. I'm going to show you this in the museum tomorrow. Then they closed the tomb. They didn't touch the gold. They needed that oil to perform or practice mummification. And then they sealed the tomb. So when Howard Carter opened the tomb, he found the double seal on the door, the original one that was broken and the newer one put on the top. Okay. The one who opened the tomb were priests, you know, smaller, you know, you know, lesser in rank, 
who wanted to have those oils to practice it maybe for themselves or for their families. So that's why they, they were not regular tomb robbers to break inside and take treasures and gold. They didn't touch it, they only took the oils and they broke the seals of the jars in which those oils were preserved. So those four organs that were extracted during mummification were dipped in those seven sacred oils. Each was covered with sheets of linen. Each was placed in a jar, which makes a set of four jars that we call the canopic jars. Talk about the heart. The heart is the only organ that was left inside the body, mm -hmm. never taken out during mummification. Mm. Never, ever. The heart is Sacred. the center of knowledge, emotions, love, mm. intention. Mm -hmm. It's not what I say. It's not what I pretend to do. I'm not making a show, you know. God will punish me according to what's in my heart. What's in my heart is the, the most important thing. The good and bad intention is here. Not in the mouth, not in the mind, in the heart. So the heart was the most important organ. That's why when we go to the Papyrus Institute, we're going to see a very traditional scene on the temples, which is a depiction of what they believe the judgment day is going to be like, a big balance. Having two sides. On one side, they put the heart. Hey, hey. Against the feather, yeah. the ostrich, ostrich feather, feather of Ma'at. Mm -hmm. If the heart and the feather are equal, or the heart is even lighter than the feather, then the man is good and he made a lot of good things and so on, so the doors of heaven will be opened wide in front of him. If the heart is heavier than the feather, so he made a lot of sins and bad things and so on, so a big unbelievable beast is going to eat his heart and he will not be resurrected. So that's why they kept the heart and they protected it inside the body by putting a big scarab, you know the scarab? Mm -hmm. yeah. Made out of solid gold in, inside the mummy on the heart. Mm -hmm. So the tomb robbers, go right to the heart. <laughs> when they opened the tombs to steal the treasures, mm -hmm. they knew about all the golden objects that were placed within the mummy, so they didn't mind tearing the linen, you know, and stealing all the gold. That's why we lost a lot of our mummies over time. Mm -hmm. What about the, the brain? They used to get rid of the brain in a very special way by inserting two tools through the nose holes and sucking it out and throwing it away. I'm sorry. How many and how many years ago was that? This was uh, thousands of years thousands ago. Thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. They knew how to suck the brain out through the nose. So you know you be telling people you keep blowing your nose, you're gonna blow your brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I, another very interesting thing is that when the Europeans came, they took thousands and thousands of mummies to Europe and they pulverized them and they sold them for portions of for long life. People used to buy uh, mummy powder uh, for long life. They sold it for, because of the, uh, you know, the rituals that they did here. What was the purpose of, of all the alabaster jars being buried with the king? Uh, part of the funerary furniture, what we call the funerary furniture, they put beds, jars, everything, you know, that the deceased can use in the eternal life after resurrection. So it's all part of what we call the funerary furniture. After they are done with the brain, the body of course will be very fragile and very delicate, so they used to stuff it with sand and the seven sacred oils and make the arms like that. In the crossing arm position, it means that the man now is joined with Asar. That's again one of the faces of God. He's God of the dead and God of resurrection. Okay. He also buried servants with him. No. No. This is only wives. in Hollywood movies. <laughs> <laughs> what about their wives? The, the, the their wives have separate, separate tombs. But were they the valley of the kings and the valley of the queens. But were they the tomb the, the, for the king, another pyramid for the queen. So it's not true that the uh, wives were buried with their husbands no. uh, alive? No. That's India. No. Hollywood. Of course not. We were but that in, they were in not Obama savages. School. They were beautiful. I mean, they were. When, when people were in the Stone Age, they knew how, women were very prestigious, they entitled high titles, they find their ways very well in society. Men were, I mean, we're talking here about perfection in architecture, in art, in science, in zodiac, Amel, in medicine. Amel, but understand, she said that that's what she was taught in embalming school. See, those are the kinds of lies oh that God. we get taught oh about our ancient people. No, they don't prove it. They, what, what do they say? I mean, they just say this and with no explanation? They said that life after death was very, very important for the Egyptians. So that in order for them to have a good life, all of their worldly goods, including their wives and, 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 and servants, and and were buried food, with them. Buried. You know? I mean, for example, in the Valley of the Kings, when a king dies, 
he has a tomb the queen has another tomb and we when we analyze the dates and things you'll find that there are there's a difference in the dates between them she died in a different period and he died in a different period and there's no such thing i'm sorry I, you know what and if i recall they in that is a European interpretation of hieroglyphics. Yeah. Yeah. That when that whenever the king is being buried and all of his entourage follows him, that they in turn are to be killed so that he will have them when he gets to the other side. So that is a we'll mystery. The, we'll see the legitimate proof to this tomorrow in the museum. I'll show you what went inside the tomb with the mummy for the king. So this will be very cleared out for us. No murders, no killings, and above all, no slavery happened in ancient Egypt for the pyramids. And we're going to talk about that in the afternoon when we talk about the <coughs> pyramid and, and what kind of equipments were built and how many men were, you, were used in constructing the pyramid. We'll mention this this afternoon in uh, the uh, pyramid store. Let me, let me do <coughs> one more piece. Um, I, I need, Sorry. personally, I need some help some symbols for resurrection. Azar, whoever else, I need you to help me with that. If they have to go by themselves, you take me where I can get some stuff sure. on resurrection. This is tomorrow at the Egyptian Museum at That's the bookshop. Fine. Okay. There are a couple of bookshops there. The other thing is if the beautiful Egyptians could believe that their bodies were going to be the same bodies that they would have in eternal life, it stands to reason that anybody who didn't like their bodies in this life mm. wouldn't they want like the same, same bodies body in another body. life. Right. And anybody uh -oh. who kept trying to improve on their bodies in this life, either with suntan lotion <laughs> or whatever, would somehow or another tamper with the whole idea of eternal life right. and resurrection. Mm. That makes sense. Let me ask you one question. You said that when they dug up the bodies of Tutankhamun, uh, Carter was his name? Yes. He took some of that? Was that the deal that if I, if I excavate and find that I can get some of that for myself? Yes. What did he take? He took things that are repeated. Like uh -huh. if there are four or five statues uh -huh. of the same, he takes one, for example. But I mean there are masterpieces that he couldn't touch, like the mask, the coffins, the mummy. The main objects stay there. Stay here, I mean, in Egypt, not to be taken out. What about the Book of the Dead? Now, you talk about resurrection. Uh -huh. The Book of the Dead was supposed to be a book that was able to teach you how to get past uh -huh. resurrection, even if you were that uh -huh. living. What about that? Is that true? Cause you... Of course. Okay. That's the Bible of the ancestors. And we'll talk about it tomorrow in the museum. And if you want to buy it, you can buy it also from the bookshop there. Okay. Okay, let's start moving this way, please. I love this group. I really do. is a statue of King Zoser. A special garment, a long garment, putting his right hand on his heart, which is a religious attitude. As you take a look at it, notice the hairstyle. The hairstyle, which is the African hairstyle, the, you know, the, the, the what do you call the... Dreadlocks. The breadlocks and everything is there, thick and beautiful, covered with the Nemes headdress. The Nemes headdress is a royal dress put on the hair. And notice the face. Notice the face of the king. The high cheekbones and the, the broad forehead and the nose which is chiseled out. This is the founder of the old kingdom, King Zoser. 
Okay. See, I, I see. Okay, mommy. Oh, okay. So the side, right? Yeah. You, you, you push it aside. Go there. Take this side. Stand up. Oh. Moving backwards, please. Work a shot. Let's start moving. of the burial chamber and among those writings what we call the negative confessions and the positive confessions the negative confessions like I didn't kill I didn't lie I didn't pollute the Nile I didn't sin the positive confessions I was good I was honest I was truthful I was just and things like that from those confessions from the pyramid text the Ten Commandments actually were inspired you know or um, you, you find a lot of similarities between the Pyramid Text and the Ten Commandments, for instance, when we compare them together. Is the pyramid Another thing, uh, there was a tomb here, it's called uh, the tomb of Ptahhotep. We consider Ptahhotep to be one of the best men who led Kemen. Actually, he didn't lead as a pharaoh, but as a priest. He was the high priest, and he passed his right to be the pharaoh to his... Uh, nephew whose name is King Asa Jet Kara and he gave up that right for the sake of the priestly calling. In the tomb actually we found reference to a book that was found. We consider that book to be the oldest book in the world. I have a copy of that book here. It's written by Asa uh, Hilliard and he dedicated that book to me actually. <laughs> And actually, this is one of the nice books, if you want to get it, you can get this from the States. Uh, and what's nice about the teachings of Ptah Hotel, that there are 37 teachings here, dealing with all aspects in life. How a man treats his wife, how uh, a man treats an arrogant person, how a man treats a poor person, how a man treats a rich person. He passed his knowledge and experience to the younger generations. And he wrote that book when he was 110 years old. Uh, the name of the book is The Teachings of Ptahotep, the oldest book in the world, written by Isa Hilliard III. I'm going to read you a few of those um, teachings. Just to have an idea about how the ancestors thought of passing knowledge to generations. Like one says, do not be proud and arrogant with your knowledge. Consult and converse with the ignorant and the wise, for the limits of art are not reached. Good speech is more hidden than green stone, than emeralds. Another one says, if you meet a disciple in the heat of action, one who is more powerful than you, simply fold your arms and bend your back. To, con to confront him will not make him agree with you. Pay no attention to his evil speech. In other words, um, no fights, no uh, aggressiveness and things like that. That's one of the teachings. 
Another one says, if you meet someone who is your equal, one who is on your level, you will overcome him by being silent while he is speaking evilly. Another one, if you meet someone who is a poor man, who is not your equal, do not attack him because he is weak. Leave him alone. If you ignore him, listeners will wish to do what you want. You will beat him through their reproof. Another one says, if you are a man who leads, a man who controls the affairs of many, then seek the most perfect way of performing your responsibility so that your conduct will be blameless. Great is Ma'at, truth, justice, and righteousness. It is everlasting. Ma'at has been unchanged since the time of Asar. That's Osiris. Another one says, do not scheme against people. God will punish accordingly. <coughs> Another one says, if you are one among guests at the table of a person who is more powerful than you, then take what that person gives you just as it is set before you. Speak when he has spoken to you, then your words will please the heart. Another one says, if you are poor, then serve a person who is uh, of worth, so that your conduct may be well with God. Another teaching says, follow your heart as long as you live. That's one of the teachings. Another one says, if you are a wise man, train up a son who will be pleasing to God. If he is straight and takes after you, take good care of him. Do not withdraw your heart from him. <coughs> that's family boundaries here, which is the nature of us in Africa up till now. Among us here, Africans, we like to take care of each other, um, no matter, I mean, we don't, like for instance, I heard like in Europe sometimes, where, when they go away, nobody cares much about them, but for us, the show is completely different. We still keep the family together, uh, no matter what happens. Um, another one says, if you're a person who judges, listen carefully to the speech of one who pleads. A person in distress wants to pour out his or her heart, even more than they want their case to be won. If you are one who stops a person who is pleading, that person will say, why does he reject my plea? Of course, not all that one pleads for can be granted, but a good hearing soothes the heart. Uh-huh. When you prosper and establish your home, love your wife with order, then fill her belly to soothe her body. Yes. Fulfill her wishes for as long as you live. Yes. Yes. Power. Yes. She is a fertile field for her husband. Yes. Good manners will influence her better than force. Yes. Do not contend with her in the courts. Right. Keep her from the need to resort to outside powers. Her eye is her storm when she gazes. Are you listening to the teachings of the ancestors, folks? Okay. Okay. This is among, you know, uh, 37 teachings. I just wanted you to have an idea about some of them. But wait and a minute. What about the teachings of the wife to the husband? Oh, come on, read okay, okay now I'm reading what I like here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Could could you set it over the mic oh. so everybody can hear? About what? Uh, the pyramid text preceding Hammurabi's, Hammurabi's code. code. Uh, the pyramid text, of course, precedes Hammurabi's code because it dates back to 2,500 years BC. That's during the pyramid age. This is the fourth dynasty period when the pyramid texts were written. And uh, as I mentioned, these are the negative and positive confessions, 42. 